coming? Because it doesn't sound like the U.S. is getting a whole lot uh, out of this here. Yeah, if it's just for the October 15th bump, it's going to be very little. The currency text is meaningless. Um, so that would be a, a deal to say, hey, we're not fighting. It wouldn't really accomplish anything. Also on the table, though, is the December 15th inclusion of more Chinese goods under tariff, which is a much bigger deal. And if that were to be postponed, you would expect more from the Chinese side, for example, agriculture and energy purchases. So you think it's meaningless, uh, this, this sort of currency uh, agreement that they might come to? Yeah, we saw the text uh, when Secretary Mnuchin first was talking about it. And he said it was the strongest ever. It doesn't do anything. It's a monitoring deal that allows the U.S. to act under certain conditions when we can already act ourselves under any condition we like. So uh, it's basically the Chinese saying, we'll pretend that we'll allow you to retaliate against our currency policy, <laughs> when if we actually did retaliate, they wouldn't put up with it. Okay, Michelle. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, you, you have to think markets here are just saying, we don't really care if it's meaningless or not. We just don't want any more tariff hikes. We want this issue to be kicked down the road to as long into the future as possible. It's clear to me that market participants are desperate for a deal. They very much want to see this kind of all go away, even if it's just detente or truce. What I think, however, is that even if there is some kind of truce, even if they come to some skinny deal, as we've talked about, the relationship with China is permanently changed. It's never going back to what it was. And by the way, their economy is slowing because of their self-inflicted wounds and all the presumptions that we had for years about what the Chinese economy was going to do and how it's going to grow. Those are gone. Everything is different now. I, you know, Derek, that makes me wonder, would you, which side of the bet would you take? Neil Ferguson's that, that China's GDP will never catch up with that of the U.S., or, uh, or would you be on the other side of that? Well, um, what GDP are we talking about? The ones <laughs> the Chinese announce Fair or enough. their actual GDP? Um, they're the ones that they announce, I think, will probably catch up. Of course, their population is four times ours. Will China ever get close to the U.S. in prosperity? Not under this leadership. So if that's the case, markets here are saying, OK, you know what? So maybe this is a, a permanent change in the relationship. We don't they're saying we don't necessarily care, right? They're more concerned about near-term cyclical worries. OK, tariffs that could slow down the U.S. economy, tariffs that could hurt the Chinese economy and thereby hurt us too. If we're talking about a permanent uh, change, that, it, in a way, that's easier for markets to deal with, right? Because then they go, OK, well, I can figure out, you know, what does it look like in 10 or 15 years? It's, it, it takes away the, the growth worry. Derek, yeah, you... I don't go ahead. I, I, I agree with Michelle that that there's been a permanent change. I don't think that it's the case that uh, it's 10, 15 years down the road um, that, that we face that change. I think we could face it in the election in six months. So I think it's likely that we'll get some sort of truce. They're working on it. Um, but I don't think the truce will hold very long because let's say Elizabeth Warren is a Democratic nominee. She's going to come at the president for being soft on China. And that he, his instinct is to outflank everyone. So markets may be hoping for a truce. They're going to get a several-month truce, not a several-year truce. What do you think, Michelle, the practical implications will be if it's a, a permanent change in the relationship? Well, I, mean, I, I think we're there already. I, you, you know, the obsession about trying to deal with their intellectual property theft. I've long thought that that was going to be impossible to deal with. That's asking the Chinese to be different than what they are. And then even if there was some kind of agreement... It's individual companies that make the decision about whether or not they're going back into that country or whether they're willing to sacrifice what they've built here or elsewhere in the world and putting it at risk in China. Just because the president says, OK, we have a deal on intellectual property, doesn't mean that private sector individuals and companies believe it's going to be the case and believe it's actually going right. to be acted upon by the Chinese. And then people are left trying to decide on a case-by-case -case basis, Absolutely. I guess. Absolutely. Because I, that's the, always going to be the case, I think. And there's, pe there's companies who went into China with a very different... I guess, hope you would say for, for the outcome here. And what you're basically saying is that as it stands today, this idea of liberalization is not necessarily happening, but the idea that they're going to reach the world's biggest market still is, right? So I am not convinced they're going to reach the world's biggest. I'm, I'm a firm believer in markets, and you know that, right? The free movement of labor, capital, and goods. And what I see under Xi Jinping is them going backwards on those issues. They never really got to the free movement of labor. People are still forced to live in certain parts of the country if the Chinese government says so. Uh, the free movement of capital has never happened there as well. Um, I just don't think... And now they're going back to massive state intervention. They had started to undo that for 30 years, back in, starting back in 1979. Now, under Xi Jinping, it's all about supporting state-owned enterprises, which are inefficient, waste people's money, and will hold back the Chinese Sounds economy. Like you